I've, I've learned, uh, I have such a new appreciation for, for sound ever since yeah. I started doing this podcast. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. So I, I just want to start off by saying like, just how impressive you are. Not, I don't know if you uh -huh. realize that, but like just doing the research on you, I've obviously known about you for years. I've sort of been following you uh on yep. the insta i think we've even crossed paths from your days back at film independent maybe like oh you mean oh well, i never worked to come i'm on the board of film independent yeah uh, i feel like i just feel like your name is one of those names i've always seen and it's so peculiar that it's very memorable to me it is a peculiar name <laughs> i'm proud of so that so <laughs> you say manette right Minette, that's correct. Minette Louis. Okay, cool. Minette. Thank yeah. You. So You're pronouncing it correctly. Hey, uh, I'm a Carolina and I spend most <laughs> of my life telling people it's not Carolina. So Carolina. I get it. And it's important. Yeah, it's Carolina. So in in just like looking you up, you know, I want to get to the beginning of your career, but I just here are just some highlights I just want to like point out in case you weren't aware. You worked in economic development for the Hawaii Film Office. Right. You were at one point president of Game Changer Films, which is like one of the, the biggest indie financing companies for women. Ted Hope named you one of his 21 brave thinkers of free film for your distribution strategy for one of your movies called Children of Invention. Um, you also are on the board of directors for Film Independent. You're an advisor to Sundance Institute. Now you have a company called The Population and like you're just incredible like I just think it's so impressive how much you have been able to do in what I perceive to be a very short amount of time in your career <laughs> so yeah I just want to say that off the bat because it's it's important to highlight all of that it's just a matter of survival it's all been just trying to figure out how to survive <laughs> how to keep well, going and so not to jump around but that is one of my questions how do you survive in a business that demands you to be relentless and and stay sane. Yeah. Maintain your integrity, <laughs> which is right. very important. Right. And and I think your your sort of like mental health, right? Your sort of excitement for the business. I think it can really take a toll spiritually, emotionally. So you've you've kind of bounced around so much. And so before we dive into the beginnings of how you discovered the business, I am curious since you brought it up. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I think that to stay in the independent film business. It's different from the studio film business. Um, to stay in the independent film business, I think you're constantly having to tread water basically to survive and just like figure out how to change with the times. I mean, we're in a huge sea change right now with the pandemic and even mm -hmm. before the pandemic with, you know, the streaming wars and, you know, streaming kind of taking dominance over theatrical. Um, and I think that, you know, before that it was like, you know, day and date was a big deal. And right. and before that, you know, the VCR was freaking people out or at, at TiVo <laughs> and, you know, so there's always something that comes up and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I always, I always like point to uh, uh, my role, my favorite producer, Christine Vachon, who's, yeah. you know, she's a survivor. I mean, she's constantly reinventing herself and she's, you know, constantly making uh, wonderful films on the cutting edge, you know, um, innovating. And so uh, I, I only hope that my career is as a fraction as successful as hers is. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think that to, I guess to persist in the independent film business, you just, you constantly have to be nimble and, you know, pivot when you have to, you know, like with population, you know, we, Molly Asher, my partner and Derek Wen, my other partner, uh, we were primarily filmmakers. We primarily produce independent feature films um, scripted. And so, you know, but now uh, with this new company, we're starting to look at television series and podcasts and other formats because that's just the evolution of the industry. You know, a lot of filmmakers are going to uh, television because the types of films, the types of projects um, that we like to make um, seem to be more supported in television and film, so. Yeah, and so having this company and you guys have a first look deal with Topic, how, what, it, what is that actually like on the inside? I think a lot of people can covet, right? Having a first look deal, having a, a financing, potentially development partner but the actual realities of what it what it's like on the insides, the pressures, walk us through what that's really like. Yeah, well, you know, the deal just started. It literally just started at the, you know, beginning of the new year, but you oh, know, wow. I've been producing, 
Yes, very, it's very fresh. So we only had our first um, kickoff meeting last week. Uh, so I'll see what it's like. Um, well, congrats. You'll have to let thank us know. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, but, you know, it's it's this is the first first look deal I've ever had. You know, I've been producing for over a dozen years. And, you know, it's it is it's really hard to to get one of these deals if you're not a famous director or actor or, uh, you know, somebody who was a studio executive turned producer. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're very grateful for it. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so we'll see. But yeah, I mean, I think that it, it feels, especially during this time when it's so hard to be in production because of COVID, yeah. um, we're, we're relieved. <laughs> we're relieved we were able to get this deal in and like be shielded a little bit um, from the economic pressure. Because, you know, when you're, when you're any producer, you're not making any money when you're in development. You're only making money oh, yes. when you're in production. So it's sort of like everything is volunteer labor up until then. Yeah, um, which is such a weird precedent to set, to set because we all yeah. know how long, how many years it takes of that free upfront labor, blood, sweat, and tears. Totally. And by the way, it's not just confined to independent film. I just recently sold my first limited series to a, you know, big buyer. And I was shocked to learn that producers of television series also don't get paid until you're in production. Only the writer gets paid. And I was like, what? Like, how does, how you're, we're expected to develop scripts with the writer for free. I don't understand that at all. And you know, it's 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 because most television producers have deals with studios already. And so like right. they, you know, they're sort of covered. But when you're an independent, you don't have a deal with a television studio. It's sort of like you're shit out of luck. Can yeah. I cut? is that okay? Yeah, gonna- absolutely. Okay. It's an, it's actually encur- <laughs> highly encouraged. Right. Great. <laughs> yeah, we like we like to keep it real here. Um excellent. Well, Fantastic. I think this is a good moment to take a beat then and just kind of take us back to the beginning. Um, sure. How you discovered this business, because in my research, you worked at Time Magazine for a while doing marketing and business development. And there's a quote, you know, that you, you said that you were bored out of your mind and you thought, <laughs> wow, is this going to be the rest of my life? And, you know, Britt Marling calls a version of that that she experienced when she was making that pivot an NDE, a near death experience. Oh, wow. Yeah. When she was uh, promoting the OA, doing a ton of press for the OA, which is separate conversation. I, I was obsessed with that show. She talked about how energetically, spiritually, the, the path that she had chosen for herself, which was, um, you know, I think she went to, I'm blanking on the name. She went to some very she impressive. Georgetown. Georgetown. Yeah, Georgetown. She, I think she was. Finance. Exactly. Yeah. She went into finance. Uh, she Goldman Sachs and was like living the dream, you know, had all the things to achieve all the capitalistic dreams one should have. Right. And was miserable. And, and reading what you wrote, it just triggered me because she described it as a version of an NDE of looking at her life and futures ahead and going, wow, like, is this the path? I don't I feel asleep to my own life. I'm curious if if that was a similar experience for you. Well, it's, I, it, it was, it certainly was, but you know, just I, the thing is though, I'd always known that I'd been interested in film. You know, um, mm. I was I was born and raised in New York City, um, you know, where they shoot a ton of films yeah. and television shows. And, you know, growing up here was amazing. Um, and so I'd always been interested just from seeing film sets everywhere, wherever, everywhere I went. And I, and I was also, I've been watching movies since I was really, really young. You know, so my parents yeah. would take me to the theater all the time and uh, I'd watch, you know, they used to have, you know, uh, feature films on television, <laughs> like re- like theatrical feature films they would put on television, um, broadcast television. So I'd watch all of that. So I grew up loving film and, and always being interested in it, but I didn't know anybody in the film industry. My parents are immigrants from China and Hong Kong mm-hmm. um, and they immigrated here, they're working class, um, they just, you know, they, they learned English. Their English is not great. <laughs> so you're know? first generation. I'm first generation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, it just, there just wasn't, I had no idea how to get my yeah. foot. Right. So, you know, I did well in school and then ended up going to Harvard and I studied um, East Asian studies, but I, I specifically did a Chinese film and literature track. So, um, you know, sort of like cinema studies, which is great. I had a, had a great time, but it was not very practical. You know, my parents, <laughs> why are you majoring in this? Like, 
film. But stuff. they must have been so proud of you. Harvard, that's incredible. That's basically I was like, listen, I'm at Harvard, so I can do whatever the hell I yeah, want. Yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, leave me alone. But you know, I graduated with um, you know, some debt, not a ton of debt because I got a lot of financial aid, but I I just still felt this pressure being, you know, first generation um to like take care of my parents, really. You yeah, know, yeah. they didn't have much money. And my mom was always like, Oh, you should buy, you know go to Harvard and get a great job and buy me a house. And so I always, I always felt that pressure. Mm. Um, and so, so yeah, I ended up, my first job out of school was working at Time Magazine in marketing. Um, and then I moved on to work in the internet space for a while. I was actually a, a research analyst at Jupiter Communications. And it was, that was actually a fun job because I did that for a year in like 1999 or 2000. Um, and I met like all these people uh, in the first wave of the internet boom, including Reed Hastings. Oh, he actually wow. came in, like basically like people, founders of internet companies would come and pitch their startups and Netflix was a startup back then and he came in and he pitched to us and he showed us his deck and he was like yeah this is you know it's a dvd we're just renting dvds right now but like dvds are not our ultimate goal like our ultimate goal is streaming um dvds is just to to like build up a customer base until the pipes are broad enough to like you know get run content over. So um, I, I think I remember him predicting that like broadband would be uh, advanced enough to in like five years to have like most of America be in streaming. It took longer than that, but you know, his vision came true. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> but to also commit to that vision, right? For as long as he had to commit and like be, beat on the drum and saying, this is going to happen. This is going, this is the future when I'm sure everybody doubted him. Well, we all know they all doubted him. Blockbuster doubted him. And look right. what happened to them. So right. Right. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So yeah, that was, so that was a great job. And, and, you know, my, t all, I, I, you know, I, it's funny that I was miserable. I ended up being miserable working in corporate America. I went back to Time Inc. after that. And I worked at sportsillustrated.com doing business development. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I learned a lot. So I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't regret doing it, these jobs. And I think I take a lot of what I learned this, you know, sort of business background. I take a lot of that into producing. Um, but I was, I was pretty miserable. And then <laughs> after, after 9-11 happened, um, I was just like, you know, that, I think that made a lot of people rethink what they were doing. And I'm like, why am I continuing to stay in corporate America? I paid off my student loans already. I can, you know, I'm free. I can go. Yeah. Um, and so basically I took it, I quit my job after 9-11 and just took a year to like figure out what I wanted to do. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to try this film thing once and for all. And then I ended up being a PA on an NYU student film for free. Um, and it was like three days in a Jersey city motel. Uh, <laughs> but the film starred Mark Duplass. And like, there were like, there's like a dozen people from that film set that I'm still friends with and that I've worked with. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it was great. And then I ended up producing three, uh, sorry, two more NYU. No, I produced three NYU thesis films after, after that one PA experience because there was no producing program at NYU at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I learned producing. I got this free NYU film school education. But um, so you, you went to decided you wanted to work in film in some capacity. You didn't know what a producer was at that point, I'm assuming. And then you got to be on this set. Was that your first sort of aware but when you became first aware that oh there, there's like departments and like people do certain things and that's who's that person running around stressed out that's what I want to do that's the producer like how did you come to define it for yourself yeah I, I kind of had an idea of what a producer did and I was pretty sure that that's I oh is that my watch decided <laughs> to respond to, to you yeah that's weird <laughs> well I'll try to explain it to you watch so <laughs> um I, I kind of knew I didn't want to be a director because I actually tried, I actually directed a play in college and I didn't like it because I didn't, um, it was really hard to make actors emote on command. Like I totally respect what directors do, but it's like, I don't have the patience for it, you know? Mm. And so I, I just don't have the focus and the patience to kind of just like work with an actor. Um, what I like to do is like put things together, you know, hire the crew and, you know, I'm, I'm like multitasker. Yeah. So I had a feeling that producing would be the thing for me. But then as I was producing these thesis, you know, thesis films, and then I, I ended up like, I was script supervising something. And then I, I, um, I wanted to try all these different positions. Um, I was art department coordinator on the lost pilot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I was an AD on three shorts and I fell in love with being a first AD. And I actually like, started applying to the DGA trainee program. And, uh, and then I thought, wait, 
am I crazy? I don't want to be an AD for the rest of my life. It's a, that's a really hard job. I mean, yeah, uh, so. it's ma- and, and uh, yeah, very hard job, very demanding job. And also to be a really good AD is a very hard thing to do. <laughs> it's really, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. And it's hard um, period. I also, uh, you know, I'm already a type A personality. So I'm like that being an AD will just like magnify the worst parts of my personality. So <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, so it was pretty clear that producing was where I was gravitating toward. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I feel like I, my brain, I, I'm sort of equal left and right brain. Um, I've got the creative part. My dad, I have a come from a family artist. My dad was like a painter. Um, he sold paintings in Washington Square Park. My mom majored in studio art. My uncle was a photographer. My sister's a fashion designer. So I feel like I understand artists. And so um, I can speak the language of my writers and directors. Um, and at the same time, I'm also sort of like, you know, pretty, very organized and like pretty math oriented and business oriented. And so, and I think there's actually a lot of creativity um, in like business strategy as well yeah. that I relish. And so I think producing is like the perfect fit for my personality. So. Yeah. So if you had to define a producer, how would you define one? Oh my God. That's so hard to do. Um, a producer is an enabler. It, it, you know, <laughs> producer is like the wizard behind the curtain uh, who like puts the whole circus together and, um, you know, basically does everything except for write, direct and act. <laughs> so, <laughs> and even in some cases we have to do that too. Right. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, it's just that the puppet, the puppet master, <laughs> that's the producer. Yeah. How do you feel like so far in your career, the producer title, right? Like carrying that title has defined you as a person, as a woman? That is a, that's a good question. I mean, it, because it encompasses so many things and so many functions and characteristics. Um, I think that, you know, like a producer nurtures, a producer enables, you know, uh, a producer acts as a firefighter and a psychiatrist. Uh, sorry, not a psychiatrist, a psychologist. Sometimes <laughs> you know, a psychiatrist. Sometimes, sometimes you can give them drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, it, and just like, you know, multitasks. And, you know, yeah. I think you know, they, they say that women biologically are better at multitasking. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely like, yeah, I can basically have two conversations at once. And um, so, yeah, I'm really proud of being a producer. I, I you know, and I, I, it's kind of part of my mission is to, to educate people um, like what a producer is, what a producer does and, and how much influence we have on a film. I mean, the director gets all the credit, which is great, you know, um, and, and I don't mind being behind the scenes. I, I like being you know, the wizard behind the curtain, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I do think that, you know, people don't, and even filmmakers don't, uh, directors don't understand exactly what producers do because they've never, there's, there's not a lot of us who like are soup to nuts, you know, and kind yeah. of, it's, it is such a hard job that you often like split it up with multiple people. And, mm-hmm. and, and frankly, like the job has gotten harder over the years. So I do like to partner with people when I produce, um, but I've produced several features just on my own as the only producer. That's hard. Um, yeah. It's it's hard. It's on the one hand, it's hard. On the other hand, there's something really nice about being like you, it's just you and the director and the two of you are like in sync. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's something really nice about that too. So um Uh, yeah, but it's hard. (laughs) It's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. 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 It's a lot of work, but it, and it is, I feel like very all consuming, all encompassing of your life. And so, you know, I would say my producing journey has been about a decade long. And I would say in the past, like six years is where I've, you know, been a part of projects that have gone to festivals. I've, you know, sort of my name has been out there or whatever. I'm visible or considered somewhat successful by the industry standards. Um, But I find it so interesting how one is able to balance all of that for just the one project. And then as we know, as independent producers, you have to have multiple projects in various stages. And then you also have to, God willing, have a life outside of this (laughs) producing uh, part of who you are, you know? And so how have you navigated after, like you said, over a decade of your career and having done so much, just a multifaceted career, you know, it's yeah. about that stamina, right? And so you seem to be 
very much still optimistic <laughs> and a, a, a good human. And um, I'm sure you have other parts of your life, perhaps a family. And so what is that secret sauce for you that's enabled you to, to like, I hate the word balance because I just think it carries, I don't know, women are asked the balance question. So that's not really the word. It's more of just navigating the undulations yeah. of all these projects and and still finding a way to have carve out right. space for your life. I mean, I, I think that producing is such a, it is such an all, it's tough, all encompassing profession that you you have to naturally be suited for it, I think, you know, so like I, I am a multitasker, I'm a workaholic. Um, I don't like to be bored. You know, I, I like to be doing something new all the time. Like, that's why I was so miserable in my corporate jobs, because it was like day in, day out, I'd go in and like, do my job. And it was just like, soul draining, you know, because mm -hmm. it was sort of the same thing over and over again, there was like very little newness to it there's very little innovation you know um because you're stuck in a box in this corporate box whereas you know producing is independent producing is very entrepreneurial you know um you go out and you find material and you go out and attach talent and um you, you create something from nothing and and uh you keep doing so i'm sort of addicted to that you know i'm sort of addicted <laughs> to um you know like just just imagining like what a what what a movie would be it's it's um you know, it's almost like you have a dream and you make it real, right? Um, and so uh, that's what keeps me going. And, you know, but but it, you really do have to have the stomach for it because it's a roller coaster, you know, like films fall apart all the time. Financing pulls out at the last minute. All of this has happened to me multiple times. And it's it's, it's, it's heart-wrenching, you know, when that happens. Um, or, or like, you know, your movie doesn't get into a festival you want to get into, or it doesn't make the sale that it meant, you know, like there's always disappointments, there's always rejections. And, you know, so you do have to have like thick skin. Um, and, and just, uh, yeah, I mean, and you have to be naturally good at balancing your life and figuring out how to fit in uh, family, which I have, I have a five-year-old actually who, and it's being, it's harder right now because we have to, do remote pre-K <laughs> during oh the pandemic. But you know, one of my one of my mentors, Mary Jane Skalski, I remember when I was at the Sundance Producing Lab and uh, she had her two little boys, twins at the time running around. I'm like, how do you take care? How do you raise them and produce? And she actually said that, you know, producers like make the best moms because we know how to AD our lives. <laughs> Still our lives, like, it's totally true. I mean, you look at my Google calendar is like scheduled, like so yeah. tight and, and yeah. you somehow just make it work and you make to-do lists and you check them off and it gets done. Yeah. Incredible. And so in, in those moments you described, you know, where your financing falls apart the day before you don't get into that festival, there's a divorce of types, right? Since every project is like a marriage. Um, how it, it sounds like somewhere along the path or perhaps all along, you've been able to not let that somehow impact you as, as the person, right? Like it hasn't crushed you as a producer. It's like, of course, that information is heart wrenching because you put everything into it. But right. that, that delineation between, I guess, like the ego and knowing that it kind of doesn't have much to do with you most of the time, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. But like, how have you not allowed that the downslopes of the business to crumble you right. into getting stuck in the downslope. Right. I mean, I, I thankfully, you know, I have a mul multiple projects that you have to as a matter of survival as a producer. So if one doesn't work out, there's always other ones. And I think that's important to have even as a writer and a director. I mean, I've, ha I've worked with writers and directors who have had the one project they've been trying to get off the ground for five or 10 years. And I'm like, you've got to vary it up, you know, write something else. And, you know, maybe it's not time for this one. Um, because, you know, it, it, like each project, it's like, just because it does each project doesn't exist in a vacuum, you know, each project exists in relation to the time that we're in. So like, if the film, if the project is not like sort of in sync with the zeitgeist right now, or if it doesn't feel urgent at the moment, then maybe it's something you put on the shelf and maybe in a few years, it'll be, become urgent, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, you, you know, that's why timing is everything and circumstances are everything. And, you know, because there are so many moving pieces to putting a film together, like you can't blame, there's no one person to blame. Um, 
Well, sometimes there is, it's usually an agency, but (laughs) 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 But aside from that, you know, name names. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find that interesting because I I think it speaks to an emotional maturity, right? Because like you're saying, it, it does require such stamina. And I think like, I naturally gravitated to producing as well. And when I discovered what it was, I was like, oh, I've just been this way my whole life. Like I didn't know this was like a job that you could do. Um, But I struggled very much and it's still ups and downs, especially with the independent sort of freelancer hustle to not be so defined by the ups and downs, right? The Mm -hmm. highs are highs, the lows are lows, and you can't let either really define you. And the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle so that I don't get stuck in these patterns of like depression or um existential crises of like what am I doing with my life because like we said you know you don't really get paid until you go into production a lot of people don't know that if you're lucky you have back end and then you actually see that money if you're one of the unicorn indies that goes on to make millions and millions of dollars right um so you know I have finally almost 10 years into this journey been able to figure out how to not be defined by the successes or the failures Mm -hmm. and just really take them as lessons. All of it is just a lesson. All of it is information. If a project does well, that's great. That that's great for the collective and really separating myself. And I definitely feel like when I started out, I struggled with that very, very much. Like my ego was super tied up in it. So did you ever at any point have to also have that transition for yourself? I mean, I probably did, but, but, but like, like you said, like taking it as a lesson is I think healthy because it's like, if something doesn't work out, it's you, you you kind of take what you learn from that to the next experience, you know, and it, it all just builds. And so I, you know, even when I was talking about my time at, in corporate America, even though I wasn't enjoying it at the time when I was in it, like I've learned, I learned so much from it. And um, it was such a valuable experience. I wouldn't change it. Like, you know, I wouldn't, I started film, doing film at age 28, which is late for some people. And I get asked a lot, oh, do you wish you had done that at age 22 or 18 or whatever, like most people do? I'm like, no, because I think that um, having that experience in other industries makes me more well-rounded, you know? Um, and so, and like, yeah, and be, being rejected uh, makes you uh, just like a fuller person, you know? Yeah. Reject- rejection and failure is part of life. And, you know, it's, it's, it's how you come out of it that really like, yeah. And yeah, uh, life is a roller coaster. So, you know, go with it. <laughs> go with it. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's interesting um, that the way you phrase that it's, it's very poignant and um, resonates a lot with me. So thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, so I want to, I, I know I've been jumping around cause I just get very excited, but there's no order or structure to right. this such as <laughs> life, but I do want to jump back. So from Tish, you decided, okay, I did some shorts. I want to produce, walk me through then everything that's happened up yeah. to this moment. Yeah. Cause you've totally. done so much, as I mentioned Thank at the you. top, I'm just so curious. Right. Well, I, I guess I had, I had many breaks, you know, um, my first break was actually the first feature I ever worked on. I was a co-producer um, on this tiny little movie called Mutual Appreciation by Andrew Bajowski. And that movie sort of like kicked off the whole mumblecore movement. And mm. um, and so that was really cool to be part of that whole movement. Um, and then my second feature was a film called Children of Invention. And that was, that was my first film as a lead producer. So like, um, you know, on mutual appreciation, I was mainly doing like physical production and, um, and then, you know, it was a crew of like five people. So um, with children I mentioned, like we, it was a slightly bigger budget. It was $150,000. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we ended up like, um, yeah, it was, it was, it's complicated shoot. Like we, we shot in Boston and New York. We had two kids as our main character. Oh my God. Uh, we shot 25 days uh, somehow <laughs> with $150,000. That's insane. Wow. I, it was kind of insane. And then had a real crew, you know, we had like a crew of maybe 15 or so. It wasn't a, it wasn't a huge crew, but it was bigger than five. Um, and then that movie got into Sundance. So I, that totally blew open the doors and, you know, my director Z Chun and I, like, you know, it was his first feature and we, we made it a, we knew what an opportunity that was, you know, and how rare and how lucky we were. So we were like, we're going to go to every party and like, just say hi to everyone at, at every party. <laughs> so that's what we did. We went around and introduced ourselves and like, you know, to, cause we had no network. Like 
no, zero. And, um, and that is how we started building our network. Um, and cause the network is everything as a producer. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was great. Cause at Sundance, I met like filmmakers I work with, uh, you know, like I met Carla Mirabel Davis at that Sundance in 2000 oh, wow. who produced, who directed Swallow. Um, and so I just met a bunch of filmmakers that I've worked with since then. I've met um, distributors and financiers and festival programmers. Um, so yeah, from there, just kept producing features. And, um, but it, you, know, it, you know, I've been lucky enough since I, since I made Children I Mentioned, we shot in 2008, but I've made at least one, I've shot at least one feature since then, which I was like, I kind of looked back on that last year and I was like, that's kind of crazy and amazing. And, wow. and, it, but but you know I I lucked out in a lot of cases because like you know I was hired to run Game Changer Films so I ran that for four years um, and made ten features through that. Um, and and, and what, just to pause real quick, yeah, how sure. how was that experience going from being uh, an independent film producer, right, where you're sort of overseeing right. generally one thing at a time, yeah. to then having to shift gears to effectively run a company, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What yeah. was that like? I love the, ch I love challenges. I do. <laughs> so, um, you know, the corporate stuff helped a lot with that because mm. um, there was the, the accountability to our 36 investors and four founders, um, just the financial uh, facility with financial uh, language. Um, but it was definitely pressure, you know, but I mm -hmm. welcomed it. I like, I like a challenge, but it was, it was different. I mean, I shifted from being like an on the ground producer working in tandem with my directors to overseeing a slate of films, mainly as a financier slash EP. Um, although, you know, because of my producing background, I was a very active EP. So I'm, I was probably more active in terms of giving creative notes and feedback than most financiers are. And, and thankfully the filmmakers, you know, knew my background and welcomed it. So it was a really, it was great, you know? Um, yeah. And yeah, so we made 10, we financed 10 features over the course of three and a half years. And I just made some great contacts through that too. You know, Karin Kusama, we financed the invitation, mm -hmm. The Tale, Jennifer Fox's movie, Sarah Adina Smith, I'm, I have her next project that I'm developing. She made Buster's Mel Hart through Game Changer. Yes. Um, so Martha Stevens, who made Lan Ho, um, I have her next feature. So yeah. it was just a great way to enable all these women, you know, and like, you know, of the 10 women, I think it, six of them didn't have agents before they made their game changer movie. And then they all got agents and managers after we financed their films. So, and, and like they, they moved on to actually every single one of them, all 10 of them have, have either made their next feature after the game changer one or been hired to direct really great TV shows. Um, so it's just so gratifying to, to know that I was like a part of that. Um, and I'm grateful to the game changer, uh, founders to have given me the opportunity to like be in the green lighting seat, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, ultimately like, a, so that, Basically, um, that iteration of Game Changer was only meant to last three, four years because you basically raise a set amount of money from 36 investors to be invested over that amount of time. And so once that money was invested, sort of my, my contract was done. And so I kind of was like figuring out what to do next. And I'm like, you know, I, I really do miss producing. Like I, I, I am a creative person. Um, and so uh, I miss being like the director's partner and being on set and being in the mix room. Um, so I ended up launching my own company, The Population with Molly and Derek, uh, who worked with me at Game Changer actually. Um, and so we, yeah, we're, we're a production company. And we, we originally we thought we would do something similar to Game Changer, we'd be like a financing and production company. And we, before the pandemic happened, we explored raising financing and, um, and then the pandemic happened. And, and so like, okay, I guess we're a production company. I guess we're just a production company now. <laughs> um, but then thankfully we um, ended up getting this topic deal because I was developing a, a limited series with them and that the first look deal grew out of that project. Nice. And so now you're here 2021 on the other side of the pandemic. <laughs> right. Um, not, well, not yet. We're still well, in it. <laughs> I guess I just consider like 2020 the year of the pandemic and we're sort of on the cusp so let, let's just say we're getting close to being on the other side of it. And you did a panel recently yeah. with Dear Producer on what it's like to release a movie during a pandemic. I'm sure there's a lot of great lessons there and you've learned so much, but I'm curious, what are you keeping from 2020 and what are you leaving behind? Oh my God, I don't wanna keep anything for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's uh, fair. That's fair. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've just been stuck at home. I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> but you know what? I will say that um, it's just been weird because I've had, you know, I basically I released two films in 2020. No, three. Well, two and a half films. So my two film Swallow, <laughs> my film Swallow was released by IFC Films March 6, which was oh the last gosh. normal weekend before the pandemic, right? Thankfully, it was a day and date release. So it was in theaters and VOD at the same time. And so people could rent it at home and stuff. Mm. So um, that film actually really benefited from the pandemic from people being stuck at home because you could rent it on Amazon or iTunes. Um, and then IFC has been just really great about pivoting and figuring out different strategies. So they actually put swallow in a drive-in in florida and then we were the first movie they put in a drive-in um and it did quite well box office wise which was really surprising it was number one at the box office nice <laughs> yeah the week it opened but um but then they did that with like the relic and the rental and and the mm -hmm. wretched and, and those films actually earned like box office that is decent for an indie film in normal times you know mm -hmm. so um, that was really cool. Then I had this film uh, that is called Black Box and it was uh, made for Amazon movie. It was a Blumhouse Amazon production. And that was the last movie that I made. I shot that in January and February, flew home from New Orleans mid-February and I've been home ever since. But, you know, that film was, it's a, it's a, sci-fi horror movie basically. And the production of that was so, it, so fast. It was basically, we, we wrapped in mid February and then it premiered on Amazon Prime October 6th. Wow. Yeah, which is really crazy. And um, but it was meant for streaming. And um, so it just it just goes to show like, you know, like <laughs> oh and sorry. And then the third film is a film called I Carry You With Me. And, uh, I premiered with by Heidi Ewing uh, that premiered at Sundance last year in 2020, yeah. which was the last normal festival, basically. Great premiere, wonderful. We got bought by Sony Pictures Classics. They were going to give us a theatrical release in the summer. And then suddenly, you know, summer became September, which became November, which became December and then January. And so it hasn't been released yet, but it did the festival circuit last year. So it's just kind of funny because like the film hasn't had a proper wide release, but, it, it, and we, you know, finished making that film and, 2019 um but you know this other film black box which is a made for streaming film like is available to everyone all yeah. of a sudden, you know meanwhile this other this i carry you with me this theatrical film is just waiting for theaters to reopen but it, they're different types of films you know mm -hmm. black box is a genre movie um swallow you know swallow did well because it sort of um sits between drama and thriller really and horror yeah um, and so I think genre movies tend to do better on VOD, whereas my film I carry with me, it's a based on a true story, it's, it's drama. It's a, it's a different, bold, innovative film. I mean, I guess going through all of these films and just like, you know, seeing all the distributors having to change the way they market movies and publicize movies, um, so, much, so much of it is reliant on social media now, you know, film, Twitter, TikTok, like, you know, Swallow, for example, uh, was reviewed by a TikTok critic or a TikTok guy. <laughs> and in six days, like there was 2.3 million views of his review of Swallow. And I was like, whoa, that's, you know, that's like, some, that's, it's viral really. And so- yeah. I think that um, I think that the distributors who have been able to sort of capitalize on the viral social media marketing have done well, um, mm. and the ones who rely more on like traditional advertising and stuff are still trying to figure it out, you know, and and waiting really, you know, waiting to see like when this vaccine is going to kick in, when we can go back to normal, when theaters can reopen again. Yeah, so we're just kind of waiting for that to happen. It sounds like you know since you've been able to do a feature a year, pretty much sounds like for the majority of your career this great pause of getting having to sit at home last year was beneficial to you in some way it was actually because I god I would travel so much you know I traveled all the time and I yeah. this is the longest I've ever gone without travel almost almost a year now um and there was like so much work to do around the house like you know just like <laughs> things that I needed to fix, you know, laundry that needed to get done. And like, all of that's done now. I like sealed like the cracks in my walls and whatever. <laughs> yeah. All of the stuff, that, my drawers. Yeah. All the stuff that's always at the very bottom of the to do. And then five years pass and you're like, Oh wait, 
I was yeah. supposed to donate some stuff to Goodwill at some point. Exactly. <laughs> what exactly. happened? Yeah. I'm yeah. really glad to get all that done. And it's been nice. I mean, I, I, it's been really nice being home with my family, spending so much time with my kid. Um, you know, frankly, he was supposed to start pre-K um, last fall. And I was like anxious about that, you know, yeah. and, uh, but now he's at home with me. So it's good. It'll, <laughs> I get an extra year at home with him. So, yeah, I love that. So what is it that you do for self-care? Like, how do you fill your own well yeah. energetically, spiritually, so that you can output so much for so many, your family included? Well, this is going to sound really cliche, but I watch movies. I, I love movies. As I mentioned, like I've been watching movies since I was like three years old and, um, you know, like would regularly watch at least one movie a day from the time I was in junior high school. Um, I would, I would rent movies in the summertime. I would I watch probably like three or four movies in a row every day in the wow. summer. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, and there was, I remember there's one day we just had this, my sister and cousin and I would have this like movie marathon in the summer. Like we watched so many movies. We got sick, just like nauseous from watching so many movies. Is that possible? Like apparently it is. I mean, it was like, and we would rent like the craziest movie. Like I'd be, you know, we were like 12 years old and we'd rent like all these Vietnam war movies. And <laughs> like we'd be watching, there was one time we were watching full metal jacket and my, um, uncle came in he's like what the hell are you watching so um but yeah I, so I've always been like movies just like you know they take me away like they're balm for the soul so whenever I get stressed out I like I have to put on a movie so so you don't ever watch a movie and then get caught up in like the producer brain of being like oh how did they make this how did they shoot that scene why how did they get this act like all of that noise that that just kind of gets quiet for you no, but it's a part of my brain thinks that and part of, and the other part just really enjoys it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so it, it's a, yeah, I'm able to process both and uh, yeah. So movies, that's your self-care. That's like your, your, it, it is, it is. And the thing is like, we don't get out. And that's the other thing about 2020 is I've got to watch so many more movies than I normally do. Yeah. Um, and as a producer, it's so hard to find time to watch movies because you're making them takes up so much time. Yeah. And so I feel like, oh my God, I always feel behind. I always feel mm -hmm. like I need to know like what's, what movies are, what people are making now. And yeah. um, so I've been grateful for that time to catch up. Do you think one ever catches up all the way or do, no, is no. you always are behind right <laughs> you're always but there's so many movies that get made you know and it's funny because like the all the oscar pundits and the best you know critics and whatnot they always gravitate toward the same 25 movies uh meanwhile there's like a whole world making tons of movies you know tons of foreign films that get ignored all the time and uh you know so you can't watch them all uh but, uh, but, you know, at least, you know, I can watch the ones that like most people are talking about and people, the other ones that people recommend. Yeah. I love that. So in navigating the ups and downs of our business, what, what grounds you? Um, I mean, having a five-year-old does, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and I don't know. I've always been, you know, I, I think part of it is like, maybe it's working with um, like, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like I've witnessed so many people just get caught up in the whole ego fame thing of it all, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know. I've always been aware that it could change on a, your luck can change on a dime. Going back to the roller coaster thing, like you could be on this wave of success, but it could come crashing down at any time, you know? And I'm always like, I'm always worried, like, oh, am I going to lose my touch? Am I going to like, is my taste going to be, continue to be relevant? Um, again, with Christine Vachon, like she's always on the cutting edge. She's always on the cusp of like what you know, I'm like, but then there's other producers and filmmakers that I've witnessed. I'm like, well, they haven't changed with the times, you know, like this film is not this film that they just made doesn't feel relevant, you know, and I'm like, my biggest fear is like losing relevance and losing my taste. And, um, and so I, I always feel like I'm on, on the cusp of losing that, like losing something, you know, or on the cusp of failure, uh, on the cusp of my movie falling apart, you know, um, and so I'm all, you're always one step away from failure. So I, that, that grounds you more than anything. Cause it's yeah. like, you can't expect to be successful forever, you know? So I'm constantly hustling. 
I'm constantly treading water. You know, it's not like, it's not like I got this first look deal from Topic. I'm like, oh, great. I'm just going to sit and relax now. No, it's like, okay, what's, you know, we got to, we got to do something with them. We have to make a movie with them. Um, make sure the deal is renewed or if it's not renewed, like who's going to be our next first look deal? You know, like it's always like, you're always thinking ahead. Um, and even, even with like, you know, when you're making a movie, it's like, you know, as, as you're wrapping production on one movie it's like okay what's the next one going to be it's always what's the next one going to be you know um or you're at a festival premiering a movie you know it's <laughs> you're always doing the, you're always figuring out what the next one's going to be yeah and like it's fun to go to the red carpet and then step and repeat and get your photo taken and stuff and that's like and that's fun and and, and like having people watch your movie obviously is the most fun and, and enjoy the fruits of your cast and crew's labor is amazing um but it's it's not like I do it for the glamour you know, right. it's like a lot of a lot of producers and a lot of filmmakers, like the end goal is the glamour. For me, the glamour is the means mm. to make more movies. You know, it's like I take those yes. pictures so that people will invest in my next movie. Right. You know, um, it's always about the next movie. How do you stay present for the, the, the journey? Right. How do you stay present to enjoy the ride while also always having to be looking toward the future? Oh my God, it's hard. I mean, again, the multitasking, you have to compartmentalize your brain. Um, and it's true. I'm like, I was actually in the middle of production on Black Box when I went to Sundance to premiere, I carry it with me. And it was hard to juggle, you know? Yeah. And, and um, so it, you just had to figure out like how to carve out pieces of yourself to devote um, to each director to each film to your kid you know to everything else yeah so, yeah but it's hard it, it, for sure I'm, it's super challenging and I'm always impressed by the people who seem to do it effortlessly though I know it takes tremendous effort to make it look effortless and and so that's why I'm like prying you for the secret sauce no secret sauce yeah no I think that's important I think sometimes we I, I speak for myself like you're just so in the in the grind of it you're so like just going through the motions that like sometimes I'll stop and I'll be like, but I want to do this next thing. I want to do this next thing. Here are my goals. And then I have people in my life who go, yeah, but wait a minute, like a year ago you wanted to do X, Y, Z and you just did all of that. Did you even notice that you, the thing you said you wanted to do that you don't think is happening for you actually is happening right now in the present. And you're not aware because you're so focused on the next thing, right? Cause our industry rewards that it rewards that every step of the way like you you won an oscar you get off the stage it's like what's your next project it's like jesus let me just enjoy this high for a minute you know yeah totally no i get yeah. it and you should enjoy it i mean i'm not saying don't enjoy it i mean i enjoyed my time at sundance you know celebrating with my cast and crew you know i enjoyed like it, it, it's it's so it's amazing you know um our, the, I carry you with me is about these two real guys, Ivan and Gerardo, who are undocumented immigrants from Mexico, and like they've been waiting so long to tell their story. Heidi has made Heidi has been making this movie with them for so long, yeah. and um, and it's to be able to like finally show it to people at Sundance and celebrate was so just incredible. Like not just not just from a filmmaking uh, angle, from a life angle, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and so it's just yeah so you definitely have to you have to enjoy it otherwise like what what is all this hard work for what is know? it for yeah, yeah yeah for sure I think it's an important reminder that's all because I to myself to anyone listening to to anybody who's on this path regardless of what you're how you define yourself whatever title you take because oftentimes we just get so caught up in in that the rat race of it all that we can forget to just enjoy the present and the the labor of our work that gets us to certain places because it can be a little bit FOMO, FOBO, you know, there's always something new and shiny. There's always something else and it can kind of sort of detract you from the, the core of the, why you decided to be a part of the For thing, sure. you know, why you chose that project. And but that's, yeah, but that's the thing is, you know, what the, the obsession for me, the obsession over the next project is like, I, so I don't take on movies just because I, you know, as a job, right? Like I take them on because I'm passionate about the subject matter of the filmmaker. And I wanna create something that people will either learn from or enjoy or, you know, be illuminated by in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. So that is the motivation for me to like, you know, 
to use my limited time here on earth to like make as many movies and series as possible um, and leave that legacy, you know? Um, it's just, it, it, that's the most rewarding part and having people respond to the movies, like, you know, uh, getting emails from people uh, who've just watched my movie saying like, wow, you've really opened my eyes. That's like the most rewarding thing. And that's, and that's constant. That just, that goes beyond the premiere, you know? Cause it's like, you know, I, I've made the other, just the other day, like somebody emailed me about a movie I made five years ago that they finally saw on Netflix and told me how amazing it was. And it's just, it's so <laughs> gratifying, you know? Um, so. Yeah, it's an interesting art form, right? Because unlike live performance, theater, concerts, the exchange with the audience is immediate there. And what we do is in a is in a time capsule and it lives forever. And people can experience what hopefully you inject into that at any time that they find it. And I always think it's the right time for that person to view it. And so it's a very personal experience that you have with that. But we as the filmmakers, as the producers, like you ultimately have no control once you create the art and it's out in the world, how it's going to be received, the impact it's going to leave on people. And I, yeah. I've, I've said this a couple of times recently, but that it's such a privilege to get to be a filmmaker. It's such a privilege to get to be an independent film producer, especially at this present moment in time that we're living through to be a woman, to have, well, there's never been a better time to be a woman real, realistically, but just to have this access, to have the streamers, to have the entire world um, within a finger's reach, you know, I, th I think it's, it's unprecedented and it is a tremendous responsibility to, to your point, be selective about the kinds of stories that are going to shape the global conversation in, in all ways, like using any kind of storytelling to further a conversation about perceptions, about stereotypes. And heck, sometimes it's just about making someone laugh, making someone feel less alone going through. Yeah whatever experiences they're going through. I, I I went to Thailand many years ago and it was like, I don't know why, but, and I'm from Brazil. So I'm like an immigrant to this country. Like I, I, you know, but I guess I just was in this tiny little Island and I saw this family sitting around a television watching like some very classic, I forget what it was, but it was like some very classic American sitcom from like the nineties. And this was like a couple of years back. And it was just like, wow, like, this art really reaches like every corner of our globe and right. we don't never know who's actually watching. And that is, right. you know, for me, when it, things get really tough and I'm in my down slopes, that's what I come back to that at the end of the day. Yeah. You could have stayed in your corporate career and you probably would have crushed it and been on all the top lists, but you, you chose to get to be a part of something that I think is, ultimately more important and when you talk about legacy that's that's what you leave behind and, and I speak for I think a lot of the independent film producers who are out there on that hustle who are behind the scenes who are the wizards um without them we can't do this kind of work you know and so I'm I'm very excited to see what you guys do next what the population does next um so yeah. are we <laughs> <laughs> so everybody is right so um yeah. I yeah, I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to to sit with me. Thanks. And it's, it's been it was a great conversation. I loved I loved the, your parting note. It was it, it was really beautiful. So thank, thank you. you. For, thank you. I really appreciate you, um, you know, having this conversation with me. And it's been fun. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> Yay.